Okay, welcome everybody. So welcome to the uh, to this High Energy Colloquium. And this is a very special talk uh, and date for two very good reasons. And before I keep going, I would like to welcome everybody here in Philips and those who are watching us on the YouTube live stream. So this is a very special talk today, first of all because it is given by Matos Suskowski, who is the Steve Murray Distinguished Visitor uh, this week, and he's spending the entire week with us. So if you are interested in talking to him, he still has some available spots, and you can find his, his <coughs> schedule, up, so you can still sign up and meet him. The other reason why this is a very special talk is that this is the part of the X-ray Surveyor webinar series, and I hope that this means that every STD team member and working group member can watch this presentation from the comfort of your own office. Of course, if you are watching uh, this from, from your office and not from Philips, you might miss out the great hot paninis which we have here. <laughs> uh, but that's bad luck. So, today our speaker is Mateo Suskowski, who is an associate professor <coughs> at the University of Michigan. <coughs> And he's a theoretical and computational astrophysicist. And before he started as an assistant professor, she then moved later as an associate professor uh, at the University of Michigan. He obtained his PhD from the University of Cambridge. After that, he was a postdoc at the University of Colorado. And after that, he was a postdoc at the Master Institute for Astrophysics in Garden, Germany. And in a short period when I actually overlapped, overlapped with him, he was a postdoc there, and I was a fresh and young, uh, very naive grad student back then. <laughs> Long time ago. Um, so, Matthäus has various research interests, a broad, very broad range of research interests. This research interest, interest starts from black holes and goes all the way to uh, galaxy clusters. And of course, he's also interested in physics of cosmic rays. His title today will be The Role of Cosmic Rays in Stellar and Supermassive Black Hole Feedback. And before I give the stage to him, I want to mention that, of course, everybody will have the opportunity to ask questions uh, after this talk here, and both, both of you, who, all, of the, all of you who are watching us on YouTube. For those of you who are watching us on YouTube, uh, Peria has circulated a web form, and you can submit your questions in that web form. You will check the web form at the end of the presentation. Or if you fancy another solution, you can check the right side of the YouTube window, and there is a chat box. So you can put your questions in the chat box, and you can ask questions there. OK, so without further ado, you will say to Matthäus. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Um, Thank you. This is really a great pleasure to be here. Um, it's a great honor to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so um, I'll be uh, talking about the uh, role of cosmic ray uh, rays in stellar and supermassive black hole feedback. And let me begin by introducing the team uh, uh, of people that are currently working on uh, these topics with me. This is Karen Young, who is, uh, may look uh, very familiar to you. She's an Einstein fellow. <clears throat> Um, she used to be my postdoc in, in uh, Michigan. In fact, last time I, gave, I was at this very spot, I was, I was a Chandra fellow, so about a decade ago. Uh, Yuan Li, who is my current um, postdoc at Michigan. Um, uh, Ellen Zweibel, um, world leading uh, expert on plasma physics. And uh, last but not least, uh, the head of head, uh, uh, Chris Reynolds. And um, as of last night, there's another collaborator, John Suhon, who uh, made uh, almost impossible uh, possible, and he actually helped me to analyze some data from simulations in the context of X-ray surveyors. So if you are watching this online, uh, please be patient, and I will at some point show you some uh, most recent results uh, that are relevant to this mission. So here is the outline. So basically, we'll go um, um, from smallest scales to largest scales, We'll look at stellar feedback and uh, role of cosmic rays in this context. Then we will look at um, an example of um, um, cosmic ray feedback in the context of a supermassive black hole in, in, in our galaxy. Very, very briefly. I will actually talk more about it tomorrow at the ITC uh, seminar. And uh, eventually we'll go to um, the largest um, uh, scales, the scales of, of galaxy clusters, and assess the role of cosmic rays in that context. So why do we care about this sort of feedback? We care about it because it, it's related to explaining things such as this one. Uh, so relative number of halos is a function of mass. 
um, is shown here and you have a uh, theoretical prediction without feedback and uh, here is what you would uh, expect, uh, what, you, what you actually observe. So some processes are responsible for accounting for these differences here at the low mass end and high mass end. So at the low mass end, we believe that this has something to do with um, winds from galaxies. So here is a nice example from uh, um, M8, uh, of M82 uh, with nice outflow going in, uh, away from, from this disk. Um, so this is at small scales. Um, if you move to large scales, you have uh, something uh, different. This is feedback in the Perseus uh, cluster. You're looking at X-ray emission and, and these cavities inflated by, uh, by, uh, by the black hole. So basically, um, this, is, this is what happens, right? You have these uh, two regimes and two different feedback processes operating in, in both of them. But I would like to uh, say uh, in this talk what I would like to convince you of, that all of these things have something to do with cosmic rays. So if there is any takeaway message from this talk, is that uh, um, cosmic rays play an important role in how you model the feedback. Um, so do cosmic rays exist? Well, uh, some of my, my colleagues cringe when I, when I mention cosmic rays because they are very complicated and you know, kind of uh, exotic, but they have been detected um, almost um, a decade, oh, not decade, 10 decades ago, 100 years ago. Uh, I can't do even a simple math, right? This is 100, 100 years ago. Uh, Victor has detected uh, increasing ionization as he was moving in this balloon up uh, away from the ground. And um, uh, he attributed this increase in ionization to the, the uh, presence of these uh, uh, cosmic ray uh, particles. Uh, so some people were skeptical and said, well, this is because of the, uh, of the sun. You're just uh, uh, observing effects due to, uh, due to uh, this sort of differences. But he repeated this experiment during a solar eclipse and found the same answer. So, so that's really um, uh, a proof that these cosmic rays are coming from, uh, from uh, far away. And, and for, for this, he got Nobel Prize. Um, also, you can directly convince yourself of, um, of the existence of cosmic rays in, in this fashion. This is something that really uh, amused me when I first looked at this. If you look at the helmet of an astronaut who landed on the moon, you will actually see these spikes uh, in the, on the helmet. And those are due to in the interaction of cosmic rays with, with the helmet itself. So these are real things. They can uh, affect how planes fly and so on. And apparently what happens is in this situation is that when, when a cosmic rays struck ahead of, of an astronaut, they, 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 an astronaut sees a flash of light. So for a while, people couldn't really understand this, and they um, did this experiment where they put a helmet on, on the head of uh, Buzz Aldrin, and they correlated these, these uh, 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 in, in incidents of, of those flashes and, and arrival of cosmic rays. So my point here is that cosmic rays do interact with matter in various ways, and that's why we can study them. They interact with matter by means of hadronic collisions where a uh, high energy proton uh, collides with a thermal particle in the interstellar medium and pr produces pions. Those pions decay, produce gamma ray emission, and produce um, other particles, such as electrons. And um, also another example of, a, of an interaction that you can have is when uh, a low energy photon, for example, CMB photon, interacts with a fast moving cosmic ray electron um, upscattering due to this effect could produce gamma rays. Um, when you produce electrons or, or positrons in these kind of situations, those will be interacting with magnetic fields, and then you will obviously have synchrotron emission. Um, so there are various ways uh, in which these cosmic rays interact with matter, and that's why we can actually see uh, their impact. So a nice summary before we move on to the main part of the talk is, is, is this picture that everybody uh, has seen. This is uh, a nice Fermi uh, uh, map of our galaxy with these nice bubbles and also emission from the disk. And one, one reason this is interesting um, is because it nicely unifies various kinds of uh, um, mechanisms that are responsible for uh, uh, interaction of cosmic rays with, with matter. On one hand, we have these hadronic processes operating in the disk, and on the other hand, we have leptonic, uh, quite likely leptonic, at least according to some people like myself, uh, leptonic processes operated in those uh, AG and inflated uh, cavities. So we actually did some work on this. So, um, so what I will do now, I will just focus on, on feedback from, from the disk, and then we will move on to uh, AGNs and then even larger scales. So cosmic ray-driven galactic winds. This is a very uh, um, uh, hot topic of research. We recently did some uh, work on this. Uh, we modeled basically a, a galaxy such as this one, a disk galaxy, 
And we modeled this with, um, with a flash code, which is an extremely versatile um, a research tool and it's used uh, by people who um, uh, work on, uh, let's say, uh, uh, work at National Ignition Facility, uh, all the way to people who model galaxy clusters like myself. So huge range of scales. And so we applied this code to, uh, to this galaxy, um, including various um, physical mechanisms. So obviously we have gas dynamics, we have radiative cooling, uh, we have magnetic fields, um, we have uh, supernovae that go off in, in places. These supernovae accelerate cosmic rays. So these are, this is your symbol for cosmic rays. And these cosmic rays um, uh, diffuse out of, um, of, of the injection, injection sites um, um, and interact with the surrounding matter. And obviously, we have uh, gravity uh, due to the uh, entire halo. It turns out, so just um, uh, a bit of a spoiler, it turns out that this uh, mechanism by, m by means of which these cosmic rays are leaving the uh, supernova uh, uh, remnants uh, is absolutely vital from the point of view of launching galactic winds. And because it's so vital, I will spend the next uh, five minutes uh, talking about how, how this uh, transport of cosmic rays occurs, in, uh, at least in our simulations and in some models. So we have to uh, brace yourself for, for uh, five minutes of uh, um, rather convoluted uh, concepts followed by a little a bit of a uh, simpler explanation of this, uh, although very simple-minded. So here's a simple uh, picture um, of what happens when an, uh, a particle, uh, a proton, uh, moves around the magnetic field line and uh, its jar radius is very small compared to the characteristic uh, scale of the magnetic field. So k is one over that characteristic scale. Since characteristic scale is very big, k is very small. Uh, it's uh, much smaller than one over Larmor radius. So in this case, the cosmic ray basically spirals along this magnetic field line and slides along, along it like a bead on a wire. And in the opposite case, when these fluctuations in the magnetic field are much smaller than the jar radius, then this uh, gyrating proton basically sees just tiny uh, fluctuations uh, in the field and basically sees the mean field. So nothing interesting happens here. You can easily understand this. This is just simple duration. But something interesting happens is uh, shown. Uh, something interesting happens uh, when these uh, length scales are comparable. When the scale of these of, uh, um, helical motions and scale of perturbation in the magnetic field are comparable. So if you look at this picture very carefully, at B and V. Um, this is velocity, this is magnetic field, uh, these are vectors pointing towards you, this one is pointing up. If you calculate V cross B, to calculate Lorentz force, everybody here can do this, it will always act in the same direction, okay? So for a, for a particle moving in this direction, there will be force acting in the opposite direction. When a cosmic ray is moving in this direction, it, it feels force acting in the opposite direction. This cosmic ray also, um, uh, amplifies those uh, per per particular uh, magnetic field perturbations and amplifies the field. Now, for every cosmic ray going this way, there is another cosmic ray going this way, so the effect cancels out. But if there is some anisotropy in the distribution of these cosmic rays that you can quantify, then this anisotropy will be driving those perpendicular fluctuations in the magnetic field in this, uh, in this wave, and uh, the field will be uh, uh, growing and um, and you can calculate characteristic growth uh, scale of this uh, uh, instability. So this is called streaming instability. Um, okay, so uh, one more complicated slide and then things will settle down and we'll feel uh, ourselves again. Uh, so, so just st stay with me. So you have this uh, instability that, that, dry, that um, grows the field, but there are also damping processes. And as one example here, this is turbulent damping. So um, MHD turbulence is anisotropic. Uh, eddies in this turbulent medium get stretched out as the turbulence decays to small scale. And this turbulence can interact with those waves excited by cosmic rays and damp fluctuations uh, produced by cosmic rays. So there is a certain damping rate. And so if you compare damping rate to the uh, growth rate, you can actually calculate this net effective drift of cosmic rays. Um, so I'm done with complicated things. Now, here is a simple-minded uh, explanation uh, that uh, took me about a month to uh, figure this out. This is your cosmic ray uh, going uh, along some horrible road somewhere in Michigan. 
uh, and it, there are lots of potholes, and it's very small. So these are these fluctuations that are, that are there. There is no damping process, uh, which is called probably taxes. If you pay taxes, it will remove those fluctuations here. <laughs> and and if you do that, then you can move on to the uh, you know few hundred miles away to the Michigan racing track, and then you can go much faster, right? So this is w with damping. This is faster streaming, faster transport of particles. This is slower transport of particles. I'm saying all these things because it's important from the point of view of the conclusion that I'm going to give you in the end that the result uh, in terms of driving of those winds depends on how efficient this process is. So just to sum up this part, we have these pressure forces associated with cosmic rays. When a cosmic ray is moving through the medium, it experiences some, some drag force. Um, uh, and then there is also the streaming of cosmic rays, or, or in a different um, uh, model, you can also talk about diffusion. Um, OK, so uh, if you have a, a cosmic ray that is uh, moving uh, through a medium with certain velocity and it feels force acting on it, on it, if you calculate V times F, you get power, right? Power that is being lost by this, ele by this uh, electron or proton. So there is therefore also this heating uh, term associated with this. Uh, protons will be flying through, through this medium, losing energy, and, uh, and therefore by energy conservation, adding that energy to the gas. So cosmic rays can heat the gas by means of this mechanism. So we are done with complicated things. What's the bottom line? Here's the bottom line. Uh, this is a simulation. Uh, you're looking at simulation of this galaxy. This is without th these fancy uh, mechanisms responsible for transport of uh, cosmic rays. And this is with, with these effects included. And so the difference between these two cases is dramatic. That's why it, it really makes sense to invest so much effort in actually trying to quantify this, this mechanism. You can also look at this. Uh, uh, in a from a different perspective and look at the distribution of cosmic ray energy, again, without these processes and, and with. So there's lots of out, uh, outflow uh, generated by this mechanism. You can also pollute the medium with magnetic fields. Again, this is a, a vertical component of the magnetic field uh, in both cases. And you start the simulation with purely toroidal fields. So in the very beginning, um, this plot will be very boring. You will just see white, uh, uh, white color here. Um, so this is completely entirely generated by these uh, fancy mechanisms. Now you can quantify this. Yes? Um, maybe you already said this. Are you normalizing the cosmic ray rate to what's observed in the Milky Way? Um, we, 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 are, we are not doing that, but it's not uh, um, vastly different from this. You can look at, at, at this um, energy density and compare it to what is uh, seen, right? Uh, so, um, yeah. So you get this dramatic effect for a range of injections? Yes, yeah. Um, um, okay. So we can quantify this effect. Uh, this is mass flux as a function of distance away from the uh, mid plane. And uh, different curves correspond to different times. So blue is an early uh, uh, epoch and uh, red is late times. So there's some little outbursts in the beginning, but it pretty quickly dies out. And what you're left with is, is basically uh, some inflated disk extending a few kiloparsecs away from the center. This is very different from the case with cosmic ray streaming. You can see that you, you begin to grow this outflow, this wind, and eventually uh, produce this uh, continuously accelerated um, structure. OK, so um, why is this happening? So let's uh, try to figure out what the, what the actual physical reason for these differences is. So this is magnetic field. <coughs> Uh, we are zooming in on the central part of, of the disk. And if you zoom in on the central part of the disk, you will see uh, that magnetic field vectors shown by these arrows coincide with uh, uh, amplified magnetic uh, field. So these are essentially chimneys through which these cosmic rays can um, escape and, and vent uh, their energy uh, from, from their injection sites. Um, so things like this also have been seen by, uh, by others in, uh, in different simulations with slightly different physics. But, but this brings me to, uh, to the actual essence of, of, this, of this problem. Why is it that um, uh, this outflow uh, takes place and why is it that it depends on, on the physics of the transport process? So this is a simple-minded picture of density distribution uh, in cartoonish picture of the density distribution, distance away from the midplane, distance away from the center, uh, darker color corresponds to uh, higher density, lower uh, color to uh, 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 brighter color to uh, uh, lower density. So high density, low density. And again, we have 
pressure forces operating in this environment, and also uh, transport of cosmic rays. And cosmic rays are injected by, by supernova in, uh, explosions in this model close to the uh, midplane. If you suppress this uh, transport processes, then what happens is that uh, once a supernova explodes, cosmic rays basically accumulate in this disk um, and don't, don't go anywhere. So um, they do not lift this gas. You can think of this um, like this. It's like trying to lift a brick uh, by blowing at it from, from below. It will not really <coughs> work, right? Um, however, if you, um, if you let those cosmic rays diffuse a little bit out of, of that region, um, then uh, those cosmic rays will start interacting with more tenuous gas, and now you're talking basically about lifting feathers by blowing at, uh, at them from the bottom. They, they will start flying away. Um, on the other hand, if you really uh, um, um, uh, make the transport extremely efficient and uh, move cosmic rays from here to there very quickly, so quickly that they don't really have much time to uh, interact with, with this gas, middle density gas, then not much will happen either, right? Because then you will start accelerating very tenuous gas and, and the wind strength will be very weak. So we can quantify this um, uh, in terms of mass loading factor, which is essentially a mass uh, in the wind uh, divided by a cumulative uh, star formation rate. Uh, and you can do this um, as a function of time for different uh, effective speeds of that cosmic rate transport, which is quantified by this factor F. So F equals 1 means that transport is slow, um, 4 means that it's faster, and so on and so forth. So as you increase the speed of transport, you start building uh, much more uh, prominent uh, wind. You can also do this in, um, in the context of diffusion, which I really don't, uh, um, probably don't have time to go into. Let's maybe skip this part. Um, but there are different ways of describing transport, and we were basically operating the streaming regime that is also the fusion regime. Um, maybe one or last comment before we uh, slightly change topic. Obviously, the result depends on how many uh, cosmic rays you inject. So um, not surprisingly, the more you inject, the, the, the larger the uh, uh, cosmic ray uh, uh, driven uh, wind becomes. Um, so we can also put this in, uh, in perspective uh, and look at how um, this effect changes as a, as a function of uh, halo uh, mass. So this is from uh, uh, both uh, uh, Kraftsoff and, and others. Uh, wind speed is shown as a function of circular velocity. And you can see that, that um, uh, these results that include cosmic ray feedback agree better with, uh, with the simulation, uh, with, um, with observations. Uh, what's also interesting is that if you uh, look at um, actual data um, and c compare the dependence of, the, of this wind as a function of circular velocity, it does depend on what kind of environment these galaxies live in. So, for example, here, uh, for uh, larger velocities, we are dealing with mergers. So this tells you that the outcome of, of, of these simulations in a more realistic uh, uh, context should depend on, um, on their history. And so first steps in this direction uh, have been done by uh, Andrei Kravtsev and, and, and collaborators. This is a simulation, uh, hydrodynamical simulation. So none of this fancy physics I, I mentioned is included here. Um, obviously, there are many other important things that, that are included that we do not have in our simulations. But the point is that this is a hydrodynamical simulation, does not have magnetic fields, and does not have cosmic rays. Um, and so it forms a nice... Uh, this uh, galaxy, uh, there are some uh, outflows here, but not, uh, not very significant. Um, and um, this should be contrasted with a situation where cosmic rays are added to this uh, uh, simulation. And that is shown here. And this is completely different, um, as you will see in just a moment. So let's just be patient for a second and see what happens uh, to those outflows and what happens to the circumgalactic medium when the cosmic rays are included. It's dramatically different, okay? So that's not something that one should really uh, ignore, and um, it has impact on things such as uh, um, column density measurements of magnesium two and, 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 and such. So here you have a, a, a time sequence of what happens to a galaxy with, uh, affected by one type of supernova feedback, another type of supernova feedback, and eventually with, with cosmic rays. They are all different, and, and, and differences 
really depends, do depend on how you model the transport. The transport that was assumed here in this hydrodynamical simulation by construction was isotropic, but you can demonstrate that answers uh, are very different depending on how you exactly model this transport. And by the way, the previous simulation really uh, that I showed you in, the, in this video does not look like a real galaxy. So in order to get a real galaxy, you would actually have to model these processes uh, of, of transport um, in much more detail. Here is an example of how this, uh, uh, um, how big of a difference it is. So this is magnetic field as a function of distance for different physics. And you can see that depending of, on whether you have diffusion or not, whether it's isotropic or whether it's anisotropic aligned with the field, you get different answers. So this is a completely open uh, research topic, and um, we are continuing work on this. So this is pretty much all I wanted to say about uh, galactic feedback, and we're going to be uh, uh, following this prescription that I described in the beginning of going to larger and larger scales. So uh, I will just briefly essentially advertise what I will be talking about tomorrow. I'll be talking about these gamma ray uh, bubbles inflating by AGN. Those are also filled with cosmic rays. Um, and I will skip this obvious slide that everybody uh, seen before. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to look at um, those aging inflated cavities, but in the context of, of much larger structures, so structures of, of galaxy clusters. So here's one galaxy cluster with uh, Perseus. No, this is uh, M87 here, right? Uh, it's uh, not very good contrast. Okay, so this is a cavity, uh, or this is a um, uh, bubble inflated by an AGN, and you can see it in radio, you can see it in LOFAR, and the very fact that you are seeing it means that um, it's filled with cosmic rays and that are interacting with magnetic fields, okay? So what do these things do um, to the intracluster medium and why do we care? And so this is where I would like to remind you that in a moment you will see a simulation of, of, of uh, of some of these effects processed by, by John Suhon. He took one of our recent simulations of these effects and processed it to generate predictions for upcoming uh, um, X-ray surveyor mission. Okay, so why do we care from the physics standpoint? Uh, well, if you have these cosmic rays here uh, interacting with magnetic fields, then maybe they could uh, provide heating uh, to, the, to these uh, atmospheres. Why do we even need heating? Well, uh, this is a galaxy cluster uh, that is radiating in X-rays, and if you don't provide any heating, as everybody here knows, uh, it will start uh, shrinking, right? You just uh, take a balloon, puncture it, and energy gets vented out, uh, gas loses pressure support against gravity, and it begins to sink. But if you, if you include those bubbles in the same object right here, uh, then those arrows disappear, and you can possibly have a stable configuration, right? So, whether you can have this stable configuration, this equilibrium or not, depends on, on exactly how you model the interaction between these lobes filled with cosmic rays and magnetic fields with the surrounding, with the surrounding gas. So it's, it's known that global stable equilibrium does exist because uh, um, that's what uh, data tells us. Uh, basically, if you take the spectrum um, and um, actual spectrum and compare it to a theoretical spectrum where um, cooling below certain energies not suppressed, then you will get a disagreement. So you need to suppress uh, cooling of gas below certain energy, and that somehow magically is done by uh, Mother Nature. <laughs> now, this does not imply that uh, gas is in uh, local thermal uh, balance. If you look at uh, uh, H-alpha filaments, there are lots of, lots of them, and they, they are essentially an example of local thermal imbalance. So gas is globally stable, but locally unstable. And this has been studied by a number of people, beginning with this uh, uh, group in, in Berkeley and then uh, verified by many other people in, in uh, detail, and most recently by Karen Young and, and Chris Reynolds. And basically, what turns out is that when you have uh, long cooling time compared to freefall time, uh, the atmosphere is in, in, in equilibrium, um, um, global equilibrium, uh, um, versus when cooling is very short, uh, uh, local thermal instability shows up and you have this raining uh, blobs of, uh, of cold gas that feed the black hole at, at, the, at the bottom. This was also recently uh, calculated by, by uh, uh, Yuan Li in... Yes, I, I haven't figured how to find it. Uh, it comes with the music. Um, 
uh, this is a simulation of thermal instability um, um, in a Perseus like object, and you can see that um, instabilities were formed, uh, produced um, uh, tori, and the tori uh, go, come and go and disappear. This is temperature distribution, distribution of young stars, and distribution of, of old stars. And also in this simulation, you can see these um, um, uh, the same effects that were described by the Berkeley group. You can see that whenever cooling time becomes a uh, uh, certain fraction of uh, dynamical time, there's instability and, and, and blobs are formed and the feed black hole. So essentially this simulation is a departure point for our simulations that include much more so sophisticated physics uh, that, that includes magnetic fields and, and cosmic rays and heating by cosmic rays of that gas. So, so this is a reminder slide we have uh, cosmic ray pressure forces and heating terms, um, and we also have uh, uh, hadronic processes, so this is another uh, reminder slide, uh, when the cosmic ray uh, proton interacts with intercluster, in this case, uh, proton uh, pions can get produced and, and heating of the gas can take place. So what's the difference? Um, um, uh, what does this really do to your simulations? Um, Unfortunately, my laptop has just um, died. Um, this is a very complicated problem, so as you can see, the uh, computers uh, uh, malfunction from time to time. I was about to show you the results from XRS, and, 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 and we got stuck. Um, um, I'm uh, more than happy to uh, accept any suggestions to what to do. Uh, I could start dancing here, or uh, we could just patiently wait. Um, yeah. No, we're completely nothing. No, I don't. I cannot shut it down. Oh. Okay. Okay, and so, um, okay, file, and PowerPoint, open recent, this is deceptively called Michigan High Energy. Uh, okay, I think we are almost there. Excellent, okay, uh, I think crisis averted. Um, okay, just give me a few seconds and we'll resume. Okay. Okay, so what happens when you start including these processes? It shows um, jet uh, that is plowing through the intracluster medium and we have here heating by Coulomb and hadronic processes. Um, here we have uh, none of that but instead we have uh, the streaming heating and streaming of cosmic rays uh, themselves and final plot shows all these things combined. Okay, so um, first uh, difference is purely mor morphological. These things look very different. There are some other more subtle differences in terms of variability of these sources. Um, Okay, so first thing that we can do is uh, maybe I'll just uh, start by showing you what uh, this object kind of uh, looks like M87 here. I actually specifically chose this object because this particular snapshot because it looks like M87 almost. What does this thing look like when you process it through Chandra and X-ray Surveyor? Okay, so this is, this is, um, this is uh, Chandra. Uh, and this is X-ray Surveyor, and let, let me just look. Um, it's significantly more uh, noisy uh, with Chandra than with X-ray Surveyor. Now I, I wish I actually uh, lowered those uh, uh, blinds to, to see the difference. But can, we, can we lower this somehow? So we'll come back to this um, when the blinds are down. Uh, and I also want to show you uh, spectra. Um, and by the way, this is all computed by, by John Zuhon. I gave him the file last night and he worked tirelessly overnight and produced these, uh, these things. So thank you, John. Um, okay, so this is uh, Chandra spectrum uh, and this is X-ray surveyor spectrum. 
And you can see that there's a huge difference in terms of all these lines that we can detect here that you would not be able to see with Chandra. Um, and this is, again, all based on those MHD simulations that involve cosmic rays. So uh, coming back to the, to the image um, um, of, of this uh, source, now you can clearly see that uh, it's way more noisy in the, in the, uh, as seen by Chandra as compared to the uh, surveyor um, data. Okay, so let's try to understand really uh, on a more physical level what the differences between uh, these runs are. They, they are kind of interesting. So first thing you can do is you can just uh, calculate um, something relatively simple, uh, still very complicated. Uh, so you can uh, do a hydrodynamical simulation of feedback uh, by jets that um, inject thermal energy. So this symbol here denotes a bubble and these wiggly lines correspond to mixing, okay? So you have mixing of thermal gas with the ICM. And uh, it was shown by, by Karen Young and, and Chris Reynolds that this actually, uh, in, in certain parts of the cluster, can be an efficient mode of, uh, of heating of the intracluster medium. Now, um, real world is a little bit more complicated. That's why we push these simulations a little bit further. In, re in real world, we have magnetic fields and, and cosmic rays and so on and so forth. So what happens when you add magnetic fields and let's say hadronic and Coulomb interactions between um, uh, cosmic rays and, and thermal gas. So in this case, um, because of the magnetic field, this mixing here of, of this uh, cosmic ray plus thermal fluid with the ICM is somewhat inhibited, somewhat suppressed. So um, cosmic rays don't really come in contact with, with the ambient medium as easily. So, so these uh, uh, mechanisms here are not as efficient in moving energy from cosmic rays uh, to the gas. And also, if you, if you mostly have cosmic rays here as opposed to thermal gas, uh, then basically you have no, um, no heating at all. In fact, this case uh, almost completely fails because mixing is suppressed and there is no transport of energy, bubble energy to the, to the ICM. But again, uh, reality is more complicated. And in addition to these processes, uh, you also have uh, Transport processes that, again, I was arguing earlier, are very important from the point of view of launching of galactic winds. It turns out that they are also very important here um, and from the point of view of heating of um, um, the intracluster medium. So now, if you add the, the, that streaming or transport denoted by these arrows, then you can, make, uh, uh, you can ensure that cosmic rays come into contact with the ICM and they can pass energy to the ICM and heat it. So, here is what we have is uh, this, efficient transfer of cosmic ray energy to the ICM because of this efficient heating. So that's one interesting expectation. So let's see if this is really borne out by these uh, uh, simulations. Um, first way to quantify this result is to plot a number of uh, profiles. Every single uh, vertical line here uh, is a uh, profile of uh, pressure support of cosmic rays uh, compared to total pressure in, in, in the ICM. So this is one profile, um, this quantity shown as a function of radius and also as a function of time. This is what happens when you have this unsuccessful model um, that um, uh, does not allow for significant uh, mixing between the cosmic ray bubbles and the surrounding medium. So what happens is that uh, the cluster is not effectively heated. Uh, there's more and more cooling, and so the black hole becomes more and more uh, uh, fueled um, and it gets more and more upset, produces a larger and larger outburst, and you have more and more uh, accumulation of cosmic rays here. And that is actually in conflict with observations. You have too many of these cosmic rays it, that would not agree with observations. But if you add uh, uh, streaming or transport of these, of these particles and let them heat the surrounding gas, get, get into contact with, with the ICM, then uh, the, uh, the, the ratio of, the, of cosmic ray pressure to total pressure drops down dramatically. Uh, also, what's interesting is that uh, this begins to um, um, kind of beat like a heart as opposed to um, being um, <coughs> just one big explosion. Um, and if you add another effect in terms of uh, heating uh, Coulomb and hadronic losses, you, you have even lower cooling, uh, uh, sorry, even lower uh, pressure in cosmic rays compared to the uh, total pressure, which is even closer to what you, what you need. Okay, so um, in terms of luminosity, in the failed model, um, you have um, uh, some uh, accretion in, the, uh, in, in those other models. You have lots of uh, variations, um, and um, luminosity uh, increases, and this basically 
means that there is lots of uh, cold gas close to the center and that triggers aging activity. So if you look at the jet power, the jet power begins, uh, kind of switches on the moment uh, the peak shows up. So let me just flip back and forth between these plots. Uh, let's look at this one, for example. There's a uh, accretion, uh, luminosity goes up, and we expect the jet to switch on at this point. So that's what happens here, right? Jet is on, it's being fueled. Okay, so um, what, in ter what, what does this mean in terms of um, uh, actual efficiency of these heating mechanisms? So this is a complicated plot, and um, um, it will probably take a few minutes. How much time do I have because of this uh, technical glitch? I kind of lost track of. Like 15 more minutes. Okay, okay. All right. Um, so, um, okay. So this is again a set of, of profiles stacked right next to uh, one next to another, um, and this uh, in this case they are showing heating to cooling ratio, where heating is just the heating due to uh, streaming um, of cosmic rays uh, in, in, in the intercluster medium. Um, at the bottom, we have uh, uh, profiles of uh, heating due to hadronic or Coulomb uh, processes uh, divided by the same radiative cooling rate. So streaming heating and hadronic and Coulomb heating at the bottom. And uh, these symbols here denote streaming Streaming, hadronic, and cooling, uh, these are basically names of these simulations. Simulation with hadronic processes and, uh, and coolant processes and uh, uh, all processes included uh, in one simulation. So um, let me just try to point to, to the most important uh, um, elements here. So maybe the most interesting conclusion uh, from, the, from this uh, um, exercise is that um, if you look at Sim results from the same simulation, so right column, simulation that includes all the physics, uh, streaming hadronic processes and Coulomb uh, processes in both of these cases. Um, heating divided by cooling um, is dominated by streaming rather than by hadronic uh, or Coulomb processes, right? These, these lines here are brighter than these ones here. In fact, if you look at numbers, uh, red is about one, okay? So uh, as this source goes through these various stages of, of, of uh, frequent outbursts. Um, during those outbursts, heating is uh, completely dominated by, by this mechanism as opposed to uh, hadronic or, or Coulomb processes. And this is, again, very different from the simulation that does not include transport processes, which is here. Here, um, um, this just looks completely different, and uh, variability for the source, for example, is completely uh, changed. It's not as, as, as um, rapidly changing as in these cases. What does this look in terms of um, uh, profiles? Um, so again, hadronic uh, slash Coulomb uh, case that failed, uh, clearly failed because at least, at least because of the temperature distribution. If you plot temperature as a function of radius, temperature basically plummets in the middle, uh, plummets at even larger radii. This is from zero to about 200. Uh, 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 kiloparsecs. So basically this cluster is not effectively heated because there is not much mixing um, of, of bubble material with the surroundings. Um, and that's very different from those cases where streaming is included. Uh, there are some oscillations here, but at least it's quasi-stable. The same happens in, in terms of entropy. Um, this is entropy normalized by initial entropy. So uh, this well, plot in, at t equals zero would look like a horizontal line here. So in the failed model, basically, entropy becomes lower and lower, and you get to pr produce these cold, dense blobs that are not really uh, observed. But this is not what happens in the other case, where you just uh, vary uh, entropy around some mean. And the bottom panel here shows what, what you get when you take uh, temperature and, uh, and weight by, by uh, emission of the gas. OK. Um, right. So in terms of coming back to the X-ray sur surveyor um, science, um, I want to um, emphasize that basically uh, these models are um, produce different predictions depending on, on what physics you put in. So for example, there is more AGN variability when you put uh, more realistic physics into these simulations. However, there are also this prolonged period of, of, of quieter uh, behavior in the atmosphere. Uh, some of the movies showed um, that AGN was 
you know, producing those bubbles in the, in the middle, but uh, nevertheless, atmosphere was not very perturbed at, at those times. And this is more or less consistent with Hitomi, although we didn't quantify it uh, yet. Uh, but we definitely can, and we can do a uh, similar type of analysis with the tools that, that, that John Suhon helped uh, us with um, yesterday and this morning. And also bubble dynamics is very different when you include um, uh, cosmic rays. Cosmic rays uh, uh, essentially correspond to a fluid that is much lighter than, than thermal gas. And finally, I have a, a permission. Uh, um, I obtained a written permission from Rich Muschatsky to, to say that there are uh, constraints on um, 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 amount of non-thermal particles um, uh, in, in the ICM of the Perseus cluster. Um, there are limits um, uh, from Hitomi, um, and the hope is that uh, because of comparable uh, angular resolution of, of spectral, uh, sorry, spectral resolution of, of X-ray surveyor, and, and, and also very large collecting uh, area, maybe we could uh, actually replace those uh, those uh, limits um, by actual measurements and see if if the amounts of, of non-thermal uh, particles in the ICM can actually be reconciled with what is needed to build these successful uh, models of, of, of these objects. I'm going to skip this technical slide for now. A uh, few comments uh, about um, consistency of, um, of these models with, um, with the data. So one test I just mentioned, you could try to actually look at uh, line ratios in, in the iron line complex and see if they are in, uh, in agreement with whether models are in agreement with observations. But you could also uh, do some things even now. So this is a uh, um, slide from Christoph Frommer from a recent meeting that we attended. And this is looking at um, uh, gamma ray emission, uh, um, observed gamma ray emission. Uh, and uh, the slide also compares these, uh, these measurements of observed uh, uh, limits um, uh, compares them to actual uh, results from, from simple one-dimensional CD state models that, that uh, uh, they came up with. And it turns out that at least in those CD state model um, cases, there is uh, no violation of that uh, observational cons constraint. Uh, so basically, model does not overproduce gamma ray emission. So just because you don't detect a cluster in, in gamma rays does not mean that cosmic rays are unimportant. They can be still... Um, um, uh, responsible for keeping these models in uh, atmospheres in steady state, and yet they will not overproduce uh, gamma ray emission. Uh, you can also look at uh, constraints from uh, from radio emission, and uh, here, uh, well, what is shown again from the same work, um, based on one-dimensional simple steady state solutions. Uh, what is shown is predicted uh, flux divided by observed flux, and these objects here do not. Uh, uh, violate these constraints. Uh, there is some dis uh, disagreement at um, high s uh, surface, oh, sorry, s uh, star formation rate, but those objects may simply be out of equilibrium and they don't need to be uh, uh, heated. Um, so, so in large number of objects, uh, Perseus, Virgo, and others that we uh, very well know, uh, these mechanisms could be very important. Um, okay, so do I have a few minutes left? Um, yeah, so um, pretty much all I, I said uh, up to this point had something to, uh, to do with, uh, at least in terms of clusters, had to do with heating of this tenuous hot phase of the intra-cluster medium. But we also have filaments that are very cold, um, and you can see them in H-alpha. So here's H-alpha emission as a function of cooling divided by freefall time. And some of, uh, in some of the clusters where cooling is short, you can see a lot of that emission. So there's a lot of filaments uh, filled with um, cooled gas. Now, you can calculate cooling time, and it's um, only about 3 uh, million years, depends, depending on where you exactly look. But the point is that this cooling time is much shorter than the dynamical time. Um, um, and so if you think about where these filaments are coming from, some people argue that they are falling in because they were locally produced in, in the ISM and decoupled by this thermal instability. Some other ideas involve dragging the gas out of the center. In both cases, the relevant uh, time scale is the dynamical uh, time scale. This is happening on, uh, this uplift is happening on the sound speed that is comparable to the dynamical time. So if the cooling time of these filaments is a tiny fraction of the dynamical time, 
uh, why are they there? Why did they not disappear? There must be some mechanism that is continuously powering them. Um, and so, um, here, by the way, this is just an illustration of why we, we think they could be actually filaments, right? So if you, if you have a non-viscous medium, then you have lots of turbulence, but in more viscous medium, you will get something that actually looks like M87. So maybe they are like this because, because the, this medium is viscous, and we do, we do see these strands uh, in the Perseus as well. And so actually Andy Fabian has a, a nice uh, uh, fondue model of this. Uh, uh, so this is your filament, this is a bubble, uh, there's a heating source, uh, um, and so um, something is powering the filament, right? So what is it, uh, really? It's almost definitely not, not this mechanism, but it has some nice uh, similarities. Um, so um, one idea uh, we had recently with, uh, or Eugene had, and, we, uh, and Alex Chekhochikin uh, helped out a little bit, is related to reconnection. So if you have um, central source um, of feedback and you drag these um, bubbles uh, away from the center and try to uplift the material, then magnetic field in those, in, in those tails of those bubbles will be oppositely oriented. So as these structures move away from the center, these oppositely oriented magnetic field lines will be getting closer to each other and eventually will reconnect. So they will be reconnecting and, and heating the gas and providing heating right, right where it's needed. So that's one possibility. And now I just, um, unfortunately, I didn't change this slide, but for historical reasons, I will show you an old slide that I prepared for uh, Maryland Colloquium recently. They allow people to scribble on, on walls, which is fantastic. So, so this paper that I'm writing right now is basically uh, all about converting these scribbles into, uh, into uh, um, a story about how heating could take place um, in those filaments, a story about heating of filaments by cosmic rays. And if you do some uh, simple, go through some simple arguments and uh, accrete uh, material onto the filaments uh, due to cooling, due to the lack of balance uh, um, between uh, uh, pressures caused by a s very fast cooling, and in the process you bring in a um, small amount of cosmic rays um, to the center, you can amplify the energy density of cosmic rays here, you can amplify uh, fields, and you can actually calculate these heating terms that we've been talking about earlier, and it turns out that you can match uh, the energy flux from these filaments, this is a part of a, of a log filament, um, to what is observed, for example, in M87 uh, for some very se sensible uh, assumptions. So um, this was the last thing I want to tell you. I just want to go through all the points. I think I'm pretty much out of time at this point. So, so what we talked about uh, were uh, global simulations of MHD uh, with cosmic rays, uh, feedback from cosmic rays in a, a range of situations, starburst galaxies, Fermi bubbles. I'll again say more about this tomorrow, um, and galaxy clusters. We went through from smallest scales to largest scales. Um, my main point uh, with regard to the starburst galaxies or, or uh, star-forming galaxies was that cosmic rays can significantly aid in launching of, of those uh, uh, galactic winds. And uh, the key element in terms of physics here is the transport process. Um, OK, uh, more on the Fermi bubbles tomorrow. And then we talked about galaxy uh, uh, clusters. And I was arguing that. Uh, cosmic ray feedback um, and cosmic rays supplied by the black hole in these biggest galaxies in BCGs um, can um, significantly contribute to the heating budget uh, uh, in these objects and stop the uh, cooling flow. Um, and so uh, this is the very last slide. Um, so some of the more specific conclusions from this work on the galaxy clusters um, were such that uh, cosmic ray transport is essential for the self-regulation of these atmospheres. Um, and streaming instability heating uh, dominates over other mechanisms. Um, uh, what's interesting is that uh, simulations with this more uh, sophisticated physics uh, predict uh, periods of relatively slow motions that hopefully could be consistent with, with uh, measurements from Hitomi and maybe from X-ray surveyor. Um, and finally, uh, um, cosmic ray pressure is not very high in these objects, and nevertheless, they. Uh, still provide a significant source of uh, uh, heating. And uh, finally, I mentioned that cosmic rays could also perhaps provide a significant source of uh, heating for H-alpha filaments. And the hope is that all of these things, some of these things could actually be uh, uh, tested. So ho hopefully uh, measuring velocities uh, very precisely 
could tell us something about the state of these atmospheres. The dynamics of the bubbles is different w w for different physics. Um, and maybe even directly, that would be really wonderful if one could do this, when we could directly detect some uh, anomalies um, uh, in, in line ratios and actually try to constrain the amount of non-thermal particle uh, uh, pressure support and see if it's consistent with constraints from radio and, and gamma ray emission. But that, ultimately, that's what we need to do if we are to build these uh, um, full physics, um, realistic physics models of these structures that can explain um, emission across the range of uh, frequencies. So thank you. Thank you. So other questions? Okay. Uh, the cosmic ray transport depends strongly on the energy of the cosmic rays. Were you sort of taking things near the knee? Or? Uh, yeah. Um, this is. Um, um, not included in the simulation. Um, we are looking at just bulk uh, properties. Uh, this, the streaming speed uh, does not depend on energy, but other other mechanisms like diffusion may be uh, energy dependent. And in this model, in the frame rate, we are considering um, that is uh, not in included. We don't really include diffusion. We include streaming. Um, yeah. Uh, I will mention a few things about energy de uh, dependence of cosmic rays in the context of Fermi bubbles. The most recent results that Karen Young is, is the, uh, uh, mostly responsible for uh, simulate spectra of, of gamma ray uh, emission from, from the bubbles by looking at different cosmic ray energies and how they propagate. Yes. Uh, so you mentioned at the beginning that uh, you need some damping mechanism oh, yeah. You need the damping mechanism to be not efficient in order to limit the propagation speed of CRs to... Uh, if you, if you, to if you increase the damping, then you allow for faster transport. So adding damping makes transport more efficient. But, but I think in terms of the formulation, you are assuming that the cosmic rate uh, drifting speed is limited to, to alphane speed, which means damping is not efficient. Uh, the, um, correct. Uh, if you, if you, yes. But but if you uh, uh, start increasing damping, then uh, the propagation speed will be actually super alphanic. Okay. But I assume damping is not. Well, in your formulation, the uh, implicit assumption is that damping is not efficient. Is that correct? Uh, that is not correct. I will be happy to talk more about this. Okay. But yeah. Yes. Uh, you you show the results of simulations where you have the time versus the amount of cosmic ray. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, the stack so, profiles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what uh, says the time scales for this uh, larger sort of cycle and the smaller? Um, um, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's what, that's what um, I, I should think more about it, but that's what comes out of the simulation. Right, but, but the, yeah, uh, yeah, physically. Uh, physically, what this what sets the scale of intermittency in this case, yeah. um, we don't have a good explanation uh, for this. I think uh, Karen and Chris will have to sit down and think about it. Yeah, because um, that's interesting when you yeah. talk about the clusters yeah. and the... Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I want to point out that, that um, yeah, there are outbursts, but uh, I want to be very clear uh, and say that uh, the, the AGN in the middle is always on. It's just changing uh, um, intensity, but it's never really disappearing. Uh, it's not like, it, there are periods where it's really uh, high in terms of intensity, but then it drops down, but still is present. Uh, bubbles, so it goes to different um, modes, I think, maybe that way. Yeah, so for the magnetic field curve, these how do you exactly insert that? Because, for example, simulations, have not a very good job in predicting, for example, the properties of magnetic fields in galaxies or even in clusters starting from some yeah. condition. They completely fail, yeah. actually. So yeah. how do you know but that? That's a good question. And, um, fortunately, I don't think it matters that much for the following reason. Um, so if you um, suppose that uh, you do, did a simulation where you actually injected a magnetic field as opposed to not doing that, um, um, and in both cases you included magnetic fields in the ambient medium, these simulations will not be very different from each other. Uh, so actually, we we uh, discovered this <laughs> obvious fact um, uh, a long time ago in the context of Fermi bubbles. Again, uh, we injected magnetic fields into the Fermi bubbles at the level of about one microgauss, just for the sake of argument, and um, and they expanded very quickly. 
and uh, the field strength in, in those structures was very low, simply because of adiabatic expansion. So you start with some fields and you basically get, get close to zero field, unless you uh, manage to um, uh, mix in the field from, from the outside. So what, what um, determines the field strength in the, in the simulations is mostly just steering of, of the ambient magnetized gas by these jets, and, and that is, we can model from, you know, dare I say, from first principles, where you can just churn the gas and, and amplify the field. Last question, or last question, <laughs> <laughs> so were there any offline questions? Any? Um, yeah, no, no. Okay. Okay. So last time, my host again. Thank you. <laughs> giving the IPC, is it an appropriate IPC like one more? Thank you.